It's funny how the darkness can play tricks on you. How fear just preys on your mind. There used to be a show called Fear Factor. Did you ever watch it? It was a show where they take people and they put them in kind of scary situations. And you as the audience, you had a chance to watch. And so maybe they take someone, they put them in a really tight spot and prey on your claustrophobia. Or they take someone, they put them way up high in a tower and they'd, they'd prey on your fear of heights. They'd put people in crazy situations, underwater, all kinds of places. And what was funny about the show is you knew they were safe. Like they weren't going to let someone die on television, huh? And yet even with all the safety measures in place, it was amazing how the fear just took over. But I think my favorite ones were the ones in the dark. They take people that they'd put them in a room that was pitch black. I mean, they couldn't see their hand in front of their face. And yet they'd allow you to see what, what the contestant couldn't see. And you'd watch as they would just freak out. I mean, here she's just putting her hand into a tank of water. Not the kind of thing to be scared of, but she is terrified. In this one, you've got a guy who's got a pineapple just sitting in front of him. And yet, even with that pineapple there, you and I know it's nothing to be afraid of. As he touches it, it feels like razor blades, like broken glass. I mean, he is scared out of his mind. And they know. They know it's just a show. They know that they're not going to let him die on TV. They know they're not going to fill a tank up with poisonous snakes. And yet still, in the darkness, it's amazing how the fear takes over. And their mind instantly goes to the worst possible place. In our sermon text, we find Daniel in the dark. In what was probably nothing more than a hole in the ground with a rock over the top. No windows, no doors, no lamps. A darkness that was deafening. He could not see his hand in front of his face. He could not tell where the wall began and where it ended. He couldn't tell as he groped about if he'd trip over something and fall. But he knew this. He wasn't alone in that darkness. There was no live television audience. There was no game show host. But there were lions. Actual lions. And there were no safety measures put into place. This wasn't for entertainment. This was a death sentence. Daniel was supposed to die in that hole. That night he sat in that hole. He knew what lurked in the darkness and he knew at any moment it could be the end. But in some ways, Daniel had always lived in the dark. You see, as a young man, he'd been taken from his home in Israel to go and serve in Babylon. And he was always in uncomfortable situation after uncomfortable situation. In the dirty word of politics, he was an outsider, as far outside as you get. And he was always in danger. His present was always uncertain. It was a constant struggle. But you know, when we catch up with him in Daniel 6, he's not a kid anymore. At this point, he's probably in his 80s. And he watches as a whole new kingdom takes over. You saw the reading from Daniel 5, the writing on the wall. That night, Belshazzar dies. The Persians enter the city, and it's a whole new kingdom and a whole new empire. And they were strange. They had strange customs, strange religion. They could be vicious and brutal. And Daniel, once again, is a stranger in a strange land. Incredibly expendable. No real connection to this new empire. In his 80s, they so easily could have just discarded him. But you know what? Daniel wasn't like a guy in fear factor. He wasn't groping around, terrified, just always flinching. He always had something to orient him. His God. And Daniel held on to his God. More importantly, God held on to him. He was with Daniel. He saw to it that Daniel was promoted again to the third highest place in the land while the Persian king tried to figure out this empire thing. And once again, Daniel knew what that meant. He knew it would mean jealousy. He knew it would mean political intrigue. He knew what awaited him. 
And so when he heard the decree that for 30 days everybody had to pray to the Persian king, it must have been like deja vu all over again, don't you think? Like he was back under Nebuchadnezzar, only this time instead of a blazing furnace that threatened him, it was a den of lions. You see, what happened is Daniel's enemies, they wanted to trap him, but they couldn't find anything. He was good at his job. He was smart. He was capable. He was honest. But he did have this one thing. His God. And that's how they attacked him. They go to the king with a deal that seemed like something in his best interest. Tell everyone they've got to pray only to the king for 30 days. I mean, after all, he's taking over this new kingdom. He's got to find some way to consolidate his power. What better way to do it than this? The king signs off on it. The trap is set. And Daniel walks right into it. We read from Daniel chapter 6. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days anyone who prays to any god or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, The decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. You know, Daniel could have found a way to weasel out of it, don't you think? I mean, he could have just not prayed for 30 days. He could have went in his basement. He could have shut his window. He could have changed his routine in the slightest bit and probably got away with it. But you know, Daniel, he's an old man. He'd seen so many people come and go. He knew the only constant he had in his life was his God, and he was not letting go. And the judgment was swift. Daniel was arrested, and instantly the king realized what happens. He had been used in someone else's political game, and he tried like crazy to find a way to save Daniel because he needed him. Probably talked to his lawyers, his royal advisors, but he finally came to realize he had one of two options. Either change the law and look weak, or lose one of the three people he trusted most in the world. He chose the latter. And as Daniel's lord into that hole, consider the words the king says to Daniel. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. There Daniel descends into the darkness. But Daniel wasn't the only one in darkness. You see, the king, he realized that this was the right thing to say, maybe. But to the king, these were just words. It's no different than him just crossing his fingers and hoping it turned out well. It's just a cliche. He didn't buy it. He didn't believe it. If anything, the king is hoping just push the whole thing off on Daniel's God. Because if Daniel's God wasn't such a stickler, if Daniel's God would just get over it and let him worship someone else for 30 days, Daniel wouldn't be in this situation. You see, the king is hoping he can push it off on him and wash his hands of the whole situation. But how does that go? Your conscience isn't so easily duped, is it? And his sure wasn't. As Daniel sits in darkness, consider the darkness the king finds himself in. It says, A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. You see, Daniel, he's the one on the whole. But somehow, it's not his sleeplessness we hear about. It's the king sitting in his palace. You see, he was in a completely different kind of darkness, and maybe one you're familiar with. It's funny how there are times in life where you just have to admit you don't have control. Times in life where you have to admit that this or that situation is just out of your reach. 
and you come to realize that the person you love most in life, that your own future, that this situation you're most afraid of, it's not in your hands. And in those times, you know what you should say. You know God's promises, that he used everything to bless you. He won't give you more than you can bear. Promise after promise. But to our sinful nature, they're just cliches. No different from the Persian king crossing his fingers and hoping it worked out. You see, what our sinful nature really wants us to trust in is the right guy getting elected. What our sinful nature really wants us to trust in is our own financial independence so we don't have to care. What our sinful nature really wants us to trust in that we'll have enough time, strength, or smarts to figure out whatever it is we face. Because to our sinful nature, all those promises are nothing more than cliches like crossing your fingers. And it's easy to walk into that darkness, isn't it? Easy to hold on to all the wrong things in life and then just to be floored when it's all taken away and we find ourselves lured into a darkness that's all our own. And in those moments, it's not hard for a mind to go where the king's mind goes. To want to put the whole thing off on God, to blame him for the whole situation. Because if God would have just done for me the things I want him to do, I wouldn't be here. If God would just provide for me the way I want him to provide for me, I'd be fine. Like Daniel's, like the king. We can believe that God owes us because of all the ways that we've served him. And we can get so angry, so badly want to push the whole thing off on him. And then the darkness really settles in. Because then you realize your conscience attacks you and shows you how you haven't been as good as you think. Because then you're brought face to face with your own powerlessness in the situation. Then you find yourself groping around in the darkness and you really have nothing to hold on to. Then you really are lost. I think it's interesting how the story is told, don't you? Daniel's Lord in the hole, he's surrounded by lions, but it's not his sleepless night you hear about. We don't know what happened in the hole. The person who finds himself lost in the darkness, the one who's struggling, is the king sitting in the palace. Because the king had all the power and all the money and the glory in the world. But as he sat there coming to grips with what he had done, none of it answered his nagging conscience. Daniel? I mean, he had no specific promise from God he wasn't going to die in that hole. I mean, he's in his 80s. He, maybe he figures this is how he goes to heaven. But even then, Daniel knew he had nothing to fear. Because there in that hole, he knew some things the king didn't. Number one, he knew what his God thought of him. He knew he was innocent. And it wasn't because he had served the king so faithfully. It wasn't because he had been such a perfect guy. He was a sinner just like you're a sinner and like I'm a sinner. But because he knew that that was at the center of God's promise to him. That God was going to send a substitute who'd take away our failings, who'd make us holy, perfect, innocent in God's sight. There he sat in that hole surrounded by lions. Maybe he could smell their breath. But he knew something the, kid, the king didn't know. He knew what God thought of him. And he knew that because of that, he had something to hold on to that would hold on to him. He knew that there in that hole, if the lions did devour him, that he would instantly open his eyes to heaven and the paradise God had waiting for him there. And that on the last day, God would raise his body from the dead and he would be no worse from the wear. And if not... If God decided to save him, well, I guess that's what angels are for. Either way, it wasn't Daniel who was in the darkness that day. The darkness is killing the king. And as soon as he can, he runs to that hole. And look at the exchange. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? I wonder how long it took Daniel to answer. 
I wonder if those words just disappeared in that hole with an echo and were just swallowed up. Even if it only took Daniel four seconds, it would have seemed like an eternity, don't you think? When suddenly he hears that voice, Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. You see, soon enough, Daniel would see a decree that would go through the whole empire, praising the God of Israel. Soon enough, Daniel would see as the exiles returned back to Israel. The temple would be rebuilt. The walls of Jerusalem would be rebuilt. The people of the promise would be back in the land of the promise. But at this moment, Daniel, he didn't see that. All that lay in the hand of a God that had held on to him. You see, there's a lot of times in life where our present circumstances, it seems like they're just lost in darkness. And maybe the thing you're most afraid of is that maybe God's will is that that very thing happen. And you have to look in the face of a loved one or a friend or look in the mirror, look at a country you love, a land you love, and you've got to realize that I don't have control and it can feel at times maybe like we're groping around in the darkness, but we're not like them. We don't live our life always flinching, always afraid. Because for as dark as the present scenes, we know a couple things. Number one, we know how God sees us. That we are innocent. In spite of all of our failings and all the things we'd like to do over, before God is like it never happened. Because when Jesus paid the price on the cross, it was a complete and total price he paid. It's all gone. And we know that we have a God that we hold on to who holds on to us. Which means no matter what the situation, no matter what we find ourselves in, even if we find ourselves in a hole with Daniel, surrounded by ravenous lions, we've got nothing to fear. Even then, we can be confident. Amen.